Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Class from Team Zero Live today. It's Saturday, January the 19th, 2013. Our topic today is Featured Teacher, and our special guest today is Heidi Sewak. We're really excited to see the uh, number of participants who have joined us today. And I just do a shout out again. If someone just pops into the session and is new and needs some assistance, please feel free to just type into the chat and someone will help give you some guidance if you need some help. I think we're all familiar with, or if you're not, a reminder that we do have a live binder. And it's a fantastic uh, uh, compilation of the resources that uh, Heidi will be sharing with us. I just want to remind you that there is a tab in the live binder for our survey and uh, any assistance you need to know about CR20 Live because at the end of the session a window will pop up and ask you to uh, set up, fill out the survey and help us uh, set a direction for our upcoming shows. And as usual I want to send us Shout out to Tammy Moore in the chat for providing closed captioning and our backup moderator, Lori Moffitt. So I think you're all used to using some of the tools and uh, just get ready here if you wouldn't mind. Um, I w uh, just a bit ahead of myself, I forgot to talk about the recording and uh, our uh, blog where we have the archives and resources page at live.classroom20.com where you'll find also the uh, full Blackboard Collaborate recording, an MP3 file, an embedded movie for you to uh, take and put in your blog or in any professional development site. And uh, as well as a link to the live binder will be links um, posted there for you to access uh, any of the references during the session. So now's the time to get busy finding that uh, laser pointer on the left hand side of your screen and the uh, whiteboard tools. If you want to click on that and show me where you are located in the world, that's great for Heidi also to get a sense of where her audience is this morning. So please uh, click on the live, excuse, click on the laser pointer and uh, drag it across the world. I know we have Azerbaijan and uh, Thailand that it, uh, hasn't popped up in the map yet. And if you can't get that uh, laser pointer, please just type it in the chat where you're from. You need the tools. I think you have no tools. That's unusual because I think they're ready for you. Anyone else having trouble with uh, tools? OK, I thought they were too. No, nope, now it's working. Nice smiley faces as well, thank you. Yes, maybe it was just a bit of a lag. Great, got to do some more playing. We need poll questions. A reminder where the option is for voting. It's just under your name on the far right. We have yes, no responses today. So if you just want to click on the arrow and, and uh, click on the icon to get the drop down menu and give us an answer to our first poll question, which is have you used wikis to facilitate class projects? People are busy voting, so that's the check mark on the right hand side of the four icons below your name. And just wait for people to vote. I'm just going to publish the results to the whiteboard. No, I'm not because I hit the wrong button that said clear. So I'm not going to ask you again, but I think I saw a large number of people who are using them, uh, Heidi, and so I'll try to be a little bit more accurate with my mouse clicks and go on to our next poll question, which is, are your students using blogging as a tool for communicating and collaborating on their learning projects? So that's yes if you are in a green check or a red X for no. Again, if you have any problem making that vote option work, just click it in, just put it in the chat. So uh, see if I can publish the results this time. And there we go. About 50-50 uh, split here, Heidi, about the number of people who are using that tool. So our next poll question, number three, is have you ever had a student-led Twitter chat? Yes, if you have. No, if you haven't, that's green check or red X. People weigh in on that question.
And I think we have our responses. Let's see, let me see if I can publish them for us. So not many have actually done this uh, activity, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing about it. I think we have another poll question today. And it's, do you use social media to connect with people outside of education? So if you're not a classroom teacher, might this is a really appropriate question for you. So again, do you use social media to connect with people outside of education? Okay, let's see what the answers are here. Now that's a big difference. We do have a large number of people who are using social media to connect with people outside of education. So let's move on to our presentation. And it's my opportunity to again remind you our topic today is Teacher Teacher. And our special guest is Heidi Sewak. Heidi is an award-winning teacher who's in Hamilton, Ontario. She's an intermediate teacher. She's done innovative work in creating new models of learning. And she's been recognized by uh, a national paper in here, Canada. Global Mail is one of Canada's innovative teachers. And her students undertook original projects that include designing an app for the iPhone. And I know we're waiting to hear how, how that went. And she hosted the world's first student-led global Twitter chat on Hannah's suitcase. And Heidi had, and her students have been recognized recently with the Ken Spencer Award for Innovation in Education and the My Share Learning Award. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Heidi to us today. She's always given the task, as our feature teacher is, to answer the newbie question, which is, uh, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So welcome, Heidi. And if you wanted to add any more background information, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, go ahead with your question and take the lead on the presentation. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you very much, Lorna. And thank you very much, Lorna and Peggy and Kim, for inviting me to be here today. I just want to know if everyone can hear me. Could you just maybe hit the smiley face at the top above your name and let me know that you can hear me? Excellent. So it seems to be working. All right, I will go ahead. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And in terms of your question, what does Web 2.0 mean to me? Uh, it is about tools and tools that I can use, but it's also about an approach to learning. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Web 2.0 are tools for building relationships with others. Uh, they're ways to access rich learning, uh, to access people and ideas and current research. It's about practices that we use in our classroom, things like inquiry, problem-based learning, and project-based learning. It's about serendipity with um, Web 2.0 tools. You can come across all kinds of amazing things that you never thought you'd be able to bring into your classroom. It's about saving time by uh, sharing resources with others. And most of all, that sharing word is key. It's about sharing our learning with others as we all move forward. And can I advance the slides here on my own, Lorna? Yes, you can. It's just besides that, you said it says slide 13, the arrows to the left. You go click on the right when ah, okay. you go forward. All right. There we go. So what I'm going to talk to you today is a little bit about how to use social media and the tools of Web, uh, Web 2.0 strategically to really build something effective in your classroom. So I'm going to look a little bit about practices and theory in general and then show you some of the ways that I've used this in my classroom. I think if you're going to bring Web 2.0 tools into your classroom, you really need to build your practice on very solid foundations. And for me, I divide them up into two parts. And one is the whole digital citizenship piece, the fact that uh, kids are creating digital footprints for themselves, and they're putting themselves out into the world, and they need to do that responsibly. Um, and and that's so much discussion is taking place around that. How many of you have? come across the term digital citizenship. Maybe you can put a check mark or a smiley face. You've heard that term before. Okay, some have and so uh, and some ha some haven't or some haven't found their check mark yet. All right, so digital citizenship is how we present ourselves publicly when we're out in social media. It's about using the tools of social media in a safe way 
in a responsible way, respecting the social rules and social media so that we create a good long-term digital footprint for ourselves. And I think something important for teachers to think about is that when you're taking those kids into those spaces, such as in Twitter, or you're creating blogs, or you're using some of the share collaborative sharing tools, it's really important to understand the implications and the long-term ethics of what you're doing. You're allowing your students in your class to create their own digital footprint by what them, you ask them to do. So it's very, very important to teach them the skills of, of responsible use of digital citizenship, to help them think about things like privacy, about um, have them look at things like terms of service agreements, what exactly are they signing up for when they're signing into these accounts of, of social media, um, what kind of access are we giving corporations to about the data of these kids we sign up into accounts. There's some, lots of ethical, ethical things we need to think about as we're moving into these Web 2.0 tools and bringing them into your classroom. Um, this link down here, just at the bottom of the slide, explains a little bit more about digital citizenship, but there's a great deal about it on the internet. And as, before you bring a Web 2.0 tools into your classroom, it's something you need to be familiar with, and it's a starting point for me when I start using these tools in the classroom. We always, always, always begin with digital citizenship. The other uh, part for me of, of the foundation is the pedagogy. And you, using these tools for with good teaching and learning practices. And making sure that those practices that you're bringing into the classroom when you're using these tools are based on solid research. What works? What helps with learners? What does the research say? And when I first uh, entered into using web 2.0 tools. I have to say I was not a naturally technical person, um, but I made a commitment I was going to begin changing my practice. And I, I began by learning how to blog. I didn't even know what a blog was when I first started. I think it took me probably two days just to get my blog set up and get something actually posted. But eventually I began uh, writing in my blog, and then someone suggested that maybe I want to get onto something called Twitter. Um, which I'd heard of but didn't really understand and so I opened my Twitter account and I began realizing that I could use Twitter to start connecting with other people in education, which was very, very exciting for me because I, I could see what other people were doing in their classrooms. But then I realized something even better about uh, Twitter. Twitter gave me access to current, up-to-date research. And I think if you're a teacher in a classroom, you've probably all been through this experience where a, the principal's been sent off or the VP or the, a lead teacher in the school has been sent off for some training on some new thing we're going to be expected to use in our classroom. They receive one day of that training. They bring it back to us. They teach us their interpretation of it. And we're left trying to figure out what exactly is this? What am I supposed to be doing with this in my classroom? Why am, I, I'm, why am I doing this? And it can be very confusing for teachers. And what I realized with Twitter is that I can access directly the current up-to-date research of why they're asking us to do the things that we're doing. And so my practice be, could become firmer in the classroom because I could see where the changes they were be asking us to make in our practice were, uh, is coming from. So in terms of the good places to go for that research and that understanding to understand what Web 2.0 is and how to use it. Uh, one of the places that you need to have a look at is ISTE, uh, the International Society for Technology and Education. And they have Can you hear me now? Because I lost my connection for a minute. OK. OK. Let me just find my spot here. OK. Another great tool to use as an educator as you're building these 21st century fluency practices in the classroom, uh, they, we talk a lot about critical thinking and how to develop critical thinking. And this is a gem that I came across, again, through Twitter. So much of what I access comes to me through Twitter. And uh, within this site of the critical thinking community, they have this amazing little tool. It's interactive. I don't have it active right now, so you can't see how it works. But as you scroll across uh, the, the various uh, topics, a little window pops up 
So you can see state the question. It tells you all the parts of critical thinking related to that particular area that you need to be teaching your students to think about, and all the vocabulary of critical thinking. So I refer to this tool a lot when I'm building my practices with 21st century fluencies to make sure that I'm really bringing the deep thinking into whatever I do with, uh, the, with, this, with the projects that we engage in in my classroom. If you've been on Twitter for a while or you've been in social media for a while and you're exploring all of these areas of, of education, you're going to come across the idea that students need to be uh, self-directed in their learning. They need to be having choices about how they approach their learning. They need to be engaged in things like project-based learning, problem-based learning, inquiry. And a lot of those terms are used interchangeably. And actually, problem-based learning is different from project-based learning, and it's different from inquiry. So it's really, really important to get an understanding of the different types of approaches to inquiry and problem solving that you can have in your classroom. Uh, so, so as you're structuring your inquiries with these Web Point 2.0 uh, tools, uh, you're getting a fully developed inquiry. So this is a, a free journal from Purdue University. It's a journal of problem-based learning. It's just an incredibly rich resource to help you understand exactly what problem-based learning is. Then there's something called project-based learning, and that is where the students are working towards you know, creating a final product at the end. And this uh, site is so rich in resources. If you go to the tool section, uh, right across the top, you can see it. There's all kinds of uh, outlines that you can use to help you with the planning of, um, of your inquiries. And there's also great videos to show you exactly what project-based learning looks like. Uh, this website here, Inquiry, uh, will help you get a really good understanding of what inquiry is and uh, something called Liberating Constraints, which is work, working within the bounds of inquiry. And there's something called Challenge-Based Learning, which is a model from Apple. And it's, a, again, a different way of approaching uh, project-based learning, inquiry, problem solving in your classroom, uh, how to set it up from start to finish so that you're using the, the Web 2.0 tools for rich learning. Uh, game-based learning is also something that you can bring into your classroom. Um, that's pretty exciting. I knew nothing about game-based learning when I first started, but James Palgi Paul is kind of the expert on that. Um, I began bringing gaming into my classroom because I was curious about it, and my students introduced me to something called Minecraft. Um, and I began to discover the very, very rich ways that you can use gaming in the classroom to help stimulate um, learning and self-directed learning and see learning in a completely different way. I began alongside my students as a, somebody learning how to, to use gaming. And my students taught me, and I just saw a huge potential for this. Two great people to follow uh, on Twitter are Melanie McBride and Peggy Sheehy. Peggy Sheehy runs an amazing site for uh, game-based learning where you can uh, learn an awful lot about it. And so it's another way to bring 21st century fluencies into your classroom. And this is, I think, the last kind of resource type site that I'm going to share before I get into the, the ways that I use these things in my classroom. So this is a gem that I'm not sure most Canadian teachers know exists. It's the Curriculum Services Canada, and it's a curating site. And this is a, a gold mine of information for teachers on how to uh, bring good practice into your classroom. Over on the right-hand side is something called webcasts and videos, just in blue there. And what they, they put there are um, teachers in their classroom where their lessons are videotaped, and you can see samples of really good practice for 21st century fluencies. And I learned an awful lot from these sites. It's free. Anyone in the world can access it. It's a great place to go, to go for watching how really good practice in the classroom works. For myself, using the tools of Web 2.0, I went through three uh, distinct phases. And the first one I call the Wild West phase, when I first discovered um, blogging and Twitter and, and all the tools of so social media, the creation tools, uh, collaboration, and I, uh, Blogster, uh, Bitstrips, those kinds of things. And it was a real time of exploration with me, where, with, alongside my students, we kept discovering new tools, and we look what we can create, look what we can create, look what we can create. And it was very much a continuous exploration of the tools. And I would say at that point in time, I wasn't really engaged in uh, super rich learning with the kids. 
we're only discovering what are these tools of Web 2.0 and what can we do, what can we do with them. And then after we had a, a period of discovery, then we began to use them purposefully for projects, problem solving, and inquiry. And now I'm at a stage in my teaching practice where I'm really concerned about bringing the deep thinking in, using these tools to build skills with, with the kids in the class, and looking at how far we can go using these tools for our learning. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a tour of uh, the projects that I've had in my classroom and the ways that I use them uh, uh, for learning. So this was um, the app project. It was our first really big project that my students uh, did and we ended up winning the uh, $7,000 Ken Spencer Award for Innovation in Education uh, for this project. So essentially what my students did is collaborate with a programmer in Australia and another one in Finland and a digital media, art, media artist in New York City to create a tourism app for our town for the iPhone. And what was really unique about this project is that it was very much student driven. Students did all the creating, all the planning, and my role as a teacher was there very much just to facilitate their learning. And we began this project, or we found this project through Twitter. I can't recommend highly enough making connections on Twitter for this. Uh, in, I think in January, I had met Cynthia Jabber, the digital media artist, and then Ian Chia on Twitter, and we were having conversations about uh, just education in general. And I really didn't know even that Ian was a programmer, and then he proposed to me one day, would you be interested in doing this project with your kids? Uh, you know, I didn't have an iPhone at that point in time. I was still really new to social media at that point in time, and I didn't even know what an app was, to be honest. But I said, sure, it sounds good. We'll give that a try. And I brought the project, the idea, into the classroom. The kids were so excited, they could not believe that they were going to get to build an app for the iPhone. Um, and I've documented this entire project really, really well on my blog, so I'm not going to go in thoroughly into detail about it, but there's a slide share on it. There's a recording of, the, of uh, a presentation I did uh, on the entire project. Uh, what was really remarkable about this project was just how deeply the uh, the deep commitment of the kids to doing a good job and how much they were able to do at a level I never ever expected from grade six students. With this project, we really used the, the tools of social media for uh, communication. So we began communicating with the programmers primarily over Twitter. And then as the project began to develop, uh, we turned to blogging so we could have longer conversations and we could upload photos of what we were doing and we could get feedback from the programmers. And eventually we, we felt, you know, we need to have a face-to-face -face, uh, conversation. So that's where Skype was brought into it and we learned how to use Skype so we could speak directly with the programmers and with Cynthia about the project as it developed. Uh, eventually the project got so big that blogging was no longer um, a tool that we could use for communication and for documenting what we were doing. So then we had to learn how to use a wiki. And a wiki really is a shared website. You can have as many people collaborating, collaborating on it as you want. And this is where we began to gather together our learning, our resources, the steps for the project, uh, so that the whole project was, was located in this one place and that other people could also access it to learn what we did to go on to develop this app. Now, unfortunately for us, our, uh, our, our lead programmer became ill just at the end of the project, so our, our app is still sitting in beta version, um, but it was a, just a remarkable project to get to take the, the kids through, so it hasn't actually been released yet. Uh, what Ian's hoping to do is create a platform that other people can use to then build their own apps based on the work that we did. Um, our next project that we engaged in was something called the Hannah Suitcase Global Twitter Chat. And we had read a book about a girl named Hannah Brady who was a victim of the Holocaust. And the book wasn't just about the story of the girl, but the story of how her story was uncovered by a uh, woman in Japan named Fumiko. And after we finished reading the book, it had a powerful impact on the kids. The kids, we thought, well, what can we do with this? What can we do with Hannah's story? And they decided they really wanted to share her story with the world and that maybe um, a Twitter chat would be the way that we could do this. And this was at a time when, when kids in, in classrooms and individual students really weren't using Twitter for communication. So it was hugely risky on my part to think that I was going to take them into a space where they would be communicating in real time and I wouldn't really, as a teacher, have control over what the kids would be doing. So it became the responsibility of the kids to plan that project and to do a lot of anticipation of what could possibly go wrong on the day of chat? 
what do we need to think about, how are we going to plan for this so it, it will work really well for us. So in this project here, uh, one of the things we had, the kids had to figure out to do was, well, how are we going to get people to come to our chat? So they had to learn uh, how to use Twitter to branch out into other networks through hashtags, how to you know, communicate their message on places like Facebook outside of school because we don't have access to it in our school, how to use different sites to let people know that we are going to be hosting this chat. And then they had to learn about, well, how are we going to archive this chat once it's done? How are we going to keep track of, of, of the work that we do in this? And eventually it led up towards a day where the chat ran for an entire day and we had participants from all over the world sharing their story, their experience of the Holocaust, of uh, those who had read the book of Hannah's suitcase. Uh, two achievements out of this project that were really important to my kids. And I think when you take kids into inquiry and you take kids into problem-based learning, it's the option for real feedback and mean meaningful feedback and meaningful projects for the kids to participate in. So one of the things that they got out of this project was that um, Fumiko, who wrote the book, and George Brady, uh, the brother of Hannah, who actually survived the Holocaust, uh, they made their entry into social media. They really weren't in social media up until that point. And because of the work uh, that my kids and getting them to come on to Twitter, uh, people are now finding out about Hannah's story uh, through through the fact that, that uh, Fumiko is now on Twitter and her, she's traveling much more around the world and she's accessing many more people. So the kids felt really, really proud about the fact that they engaged in something that actually allowed impact on the world and real impact. And that was really, really huge for them. The other accomplishment they had out of this project was unblocking. So uh, as we uh, began this project, um, a lot of people were kind of nervous what's going to happen about having these kids um, working in real time in a public space where they can interact with anyone. And because the day of the chat was so, so successful, our board then began to encourage uh, other teachers to begin Twitter accounts in their classroom. And schools communicated with us uh, from other countries that they were now beginning to use Twitter. So once again, my kids got to see that they could use these tools of Web 2.0 to change practice in the world. And that was very, very powerful for them. Uh, this project here was our Arctic Oil Inquiry. And uh, we were very lucky in our school that we have YouTube in our, our board. We have YouTube unblocked so we can freely access it. And uh, we had been watching a video in class on um, a story of a news report from Russia where uh, the Russians had sent a submarine down to the floor of the Arctic Ocean and underneath the ice cap and had planted a flag and claimed the entire Arctic for themselves. And most of all, all of the, the resources were there, inclu including a huge field of oil. And that prompted my kids to ask the question, well, who actually owns the Arctic? Because so many different countries border on that. So this began a huge exploration and, and with the purpose of answering that question, who should that oil belong to? Uh, who own, owns the Arctic. And with this inquiry, the kids spread out in many, many different directions for their learning, depending on what, what um, part of the learning they wanted to access. So it was my job as a teacher to set up the facilitation of this project, but the kids really pursued their own directions, their own interests within the liberating constraints of the fact that they had to produce something at the end that was related to this topic. Uh, you can see that one of the things that they, they learned how to use were QR codes to include, include those in their projects. Um, some interesting things that happened with this project. Up until that time, we were only using things like social media and blogging. We were using them collectively in the classroom. And it was in this project here that some of my students began to realize they could use tools like Twitter and other tools of social media to begin building their own personal learning networks. So I had a girl in the classroom named Emma, and she began using Twitter to find people uh, from the science community, politicians from Russia, trying to, to, to access them to find out their point of view. And she began to understand the power of social media to help her advance in her learning by building the right connections. And then some other kids in the class began watching Emma, and they began to learn from her. And again, a shift took place in their understanding of the power of these Web 2.0 tools to, to change their own personal learning within the boundaries of our classroom. This project here um, was our next inquiry. And this was, is, was the uh, constructed team. And it brings in the element of media literacy 
into the classroom and what do we do with it and the fact that our, our, our learners are, are exposed to so much media today. And it began with uh, a question and at the bottom you can see a link to the Association for Media Literacy. That's uh, an Ontario organization and they actually have been responsible for writing the, on, the media literacy curriculum for the province of Ontario. And they have a great resource uh, on that site that explains well, what exactly is media literacy and what should we be thinking about as teachers when we're using these modern uh, web uh, 2.0 tools in our classroom. So the question that came up in the classroom out of this was um, how much of teenagers' identities are constructed by the influences of the messages that are around them and how much of their identity is unique to themselves that hasn't been influenced uh, about that. So we began a huge exploration of brand influence, of, of the, uh, the way their own identities uh, have been developed. Uh, we, and again, once again, the kids spread in many, many different directions in the inquiry using lots of the different uh, uh, sites we had access to, to deepen their understanding of what it means to be a teenager and what the influence is of, of media literacy. And again, this project is really well documented on my blog, the steps that we went through to build a an, you know, very, very good inquiry. And this was kind of the end project. They had to build a constructed team and they had to show how that team is, is shaped by media influences, their exposure to social media, what they see on television. Uh, it was a very, very uh, interesting inquiry. Uh, this was our next inquiry that we engaged in. It was a First Nations inquiry. And at this point in my under I was really beginning to get a solid understanding of what inquiry is and how to really strategically use the tools of social media. And the first thing I felt that with access to things like YouTube and Twitter, I'm back. Can you hear me? Sorry, I just lost my connection for a bit. Um, so I was just talking before I lost my connection that I felt that, uh, so First Nations include the Aboriginal people, uh, people who are the Inuit, those who live in the Arctic. You may have a picture in Igloo, you can get a picture of that. The Métis are uh, um, uh, the Na First Nations community that has um, is mixed with the European community. And I felt that as a teacher uh, who is not from that background, it really wasn't right for me anymore to be bringing that unit into my classroom and teaching it because I was not First Nations. And that with uh, social media now available to me and the capacity for building connections outside my classroom, it was my responsibility as a teacher to connect with members from the First Nations community and help them shape what was going to happen in my classroom uh, with that, with this unit and the learning of my students. Uh, the other thing that uh, I really was beginning to get a handle on was the idea of an essential question and a big idea. And <laughs> If you've been in Ontario, you've gone through this whole process that we've gone through over the last 10 years of having to change our teaching practice so that it matches better 21st century fluencies and what actually works with, with, with children and learners. One of the things we've all had to do is bring in a big idea. And I think most of us would write a big idea, we'd stick it up on the wall, we didn't really understand what that was, but it was there and we sometimes referred to it, but mostly we continued on. Um, and I began to understand that really the big idea is the essential driving question that all of the learning on any unit is going to center on. Um, again, I mentioned that, I, okay, all right, so then I, I had this, this idea of developing a good essential question. I knew the kids should be working directly with the First Nations community. Now it was my job to build those connections. So I went on to Twitter and I just put it out there. I'm starting this unit. Who can connect me with members from the First Nations community? Because I had none at, in my following at that point in time. And one person said, you know, go check this person, go check this person. And I checked their following list. And I began to build a network of people from the First Nations community who could help me uh, with my understanding. I was also very lucky to have in my classroom uh, a member from the Métis community and whose mother was also a teacher and who's very active in the Métis community and so I began to work with her as well. So the idea of developing a learning network with people who are online but also people from the community I think is very important to as we begin to, to make the shift to collaborative 21st century learning. Um, 
one of the people that I connected with in developing the, the PLN online was uh, Janice Scott Lindsay from uh, Manitoba and she became very connected with my classroom and my kids would Skype with her and they'd ask her questions to her and here it was and she arranged a session with somebody else from the Métis community to come in and answer my kids' questions directly rather than me interpreting what I think the First Nations answer might be to, um, to whatever questions my, kid ha my kids had. Um, the idea of working within liberating constraints is, I, I think, important for us to understand with student-directed and self-directed learning and these inquiries and projects that we take our kids into. So you see a lot on Twitter that kids need to be in charge of their learning and they should be pursuing their own interests. And if you begin to do that, you learn pretty quickly that there's chaos and not get, they're having a lot of fun, but they're not getting a lot done. So the idea of liberating constraints, and that comes from Neil Stevenson, and he's from the inquiry um, a site that I had showed you earlier on, was that you build these projects in, in inquiries, but they have a framework around them and they have boundaries without them and the kids have to work within that. And so the boundaries might be uh, the needs of the discipline. So science thinks in a certain way, science has a certain vocabulary, so that you have to work within that as you're pursuing whatever it is that you're researching. And that was very, very helpful to me because you know, I began to understand that I could put boundaries in place for the kids and most of all what boundaries needed to be in place for the kids so that then we could engage in deeper, more useful, uh, richer learning that was more related to the task at hand. Uh, so I worked with uh, Jana and Cami Boyko was another parent in my class who was very helpful with this. Uh, Data Diva is online and she's great all around uh, assessment. If you follow her, she really has great advice on how to develop meaningful rubrics for the kids. Um, so I highly recommend that you follow her. And then um, with Denise Montgomery, I don't have her name here, who was another parent in my classroom. And we talked a lot about what our, our big idea or what our driving or essential question should be for this unit. And my kids had seen a documentary called Ice Age Columbus. It's available on YouTube. Uh, produced by Discovery Channel and with an archaeologist, Bruce Bradley, in, um, out of Exeter University. And we had watched that documentary. My kids had Skype with Bruce Bradley to ask their questions. And it tells a story of how uh, a new understanding of how people first came to North America from Europe and that they didn't initially come across the Bering Strait, as we'd all learned in school, but that there was an earlier Atlantic crossing. And, and the, the, it was a reenactment. It was fascinating. The science was in there. And the kids got to see uh, these early peoples, uh, how they lived, and just how amazing they were for survival. And so they had a really good understanding of early peoples in, in North America. And the next thing that I showed the, the kids was um, a video on YouTube that showed the reality today and it was about residential schools and for those of you who are not familiar with residential schools um, as Europeans settled North America the question of what to do with Aboriginal peoples came up and one of the decisions that was made well why don't we just take all the children from their families put them into schools teach them western ways, western ways and then everything will be fixed and of course it was an incredible disaster for all of those communities and so the, the uh, YouTube video that my kids watched I uh, was interviewing survivors of, re of residential schools where they talked about the abuse and the suffering and just the destruction of their communities because of that. And so my kids had seen that initial video or a uh, documentary on the amazing development of, of Aboriginal peoples and then the end result. And they're really curious, how could this have happened? How could this, these people who had all these skills and talents have become so devalued? And then what could we do to help recognize the, the true contributions of First Nations communities uh, to the world today? How are they relevant today? So that was kind of the, the framework that we worked in as the kids began to explore this topic. And they were very, very free then, because that was our driving question, to, to begin doing their own research and gathering their own information. So uh, at that point in time, we had iPads in my classroom. Um, we used the Ken Spencer uh, money that we had won to purchase uh, iPads and so they could use those to access video, to find websites, to seek their own information as they began to construct their knowledge of First Nations uh, people. Uh, we used, uh, they used their tools to speak directly to First Nations communities. We had elders come into the classroom to, uh, to talk to the kids and to share um, a, a circle time with them. And so we spent a lot of time just understanding uh, the reality of First Nations people. 
And then their job then was to, uh, we called it a museum day, was to create something that they could celebrate First Nations culture and share all the remarkable things that uh, First Nations people have to, to contribute to the world today. So uh, with their research, um, you can see some typical projects that you might see in, in any classrooms who's studying this kind of things, but they were very much research based. You can see they had iPads at their displays and they had uh, QR code access to, to links. Um, so this would be pretty typical learning that any classroom might do. Here is where the 21st century piece comes into it and how we approach learning today and the opportunity for assessment, feedback, self-assessment. So we ran our, our, our museum day over two separate days. And the kids had their displays set up all around the classroom. And we invited one class to come in and visit each of, of the group's places. And, and we watched and observed what those kids did as they uh, studied and visited our sites. And as the kids left, we then began to talk about it. Well, what at your actual museum display that you had curate, curated were actually engaging for the kids? What drew their attention? What do you have there that nobody bothered to look at? And so the kids then did their own self-assessment and critique of what they had put together and began to make changes to their presentations. So you have over here uh, somebody, this is the story of Sedna from the Inuit people. So somebody brought in a storytelling where she had, when people would come the next time, they could gather together and she would do storytelling with them. Uh, in our, one, one of the students in my class, his family has a family farm that has had a lot of arrowheads on it. And so this was a uh, video that we used with our iPads to put on display where kids could learn how to make an arrowhead. Uh, over here, there was a second section where they could go and they could learn how to speak Inuit. Here was a painting place where they could begin, uh, kids could come and they could uh, attempt to learn how to paint uh, in the style of, of um, Ontario First Nations people and I think the West Coast. Uh, here you could build your own Inukshuk. A food site was there where people could eat. Uh, the QR codes came out. And so the, uh, there was also Inuit games that were brought in so people could play some of the Inuit games. And then we ran our project again and we had more classes come in and just the whole change in atmosphere in the classroom uh, was, was wonderful to watch because suddenly you had kids coming in that weren't just looking at displays but that were interacting with the, the displays that the kids had created and it was more meaningful my, for my own kids who had created them because they could see people enjoying their work, they could understand the importance of audience and everything that we created was based on their own self-assessment and uh, they'd gotten so meaningful feedback from the people who had first visited um, first visited their sessions. Ooh, I better move along here. Okay, I have put together, um, I know this is from last year, so it hasn't been updated for this year, but the whole layout of what I did for the inquiry as well as amazing links, so it's in a Google Doc format, so it will change, of course, as I update it for this year, but you can go to that site and you can have a look and see um, what some of the planning tools that I use for that, some of the links that I use for, for project-based learning and inquiry, I've got them all located there. Um, I was recently invited to share my practice to write a blog post about this for the Canadian Education Association. And in this, this uh, post is written in relation to a, an inquiry that my kids did on robotics. So again, I was using Twitter. I was uh, connecting with a community outside the community of education. I think that's really important. So this was um, Clive Thompson from Wired Magazine. I follow him. He's at Pomeranian 99. And he had shared an article uh, written by um, a writer from the New York Times and also a psychologist about robotics and the fact that down the road uh, with there's going to be uh, driverless cars and programmers are going to have to consider how to program those cars. And the scenario presented in the article was that imagine a school bus coming along where something goes wrong and a driver is in a program. Uh, um, a driverless car being run by a robot and the robot is going to have to make the decision whether to hit the bus and injure, injure all those children or to uh, save the driver. And this was a huge topic of discussion. It just set the alarms off in my class. I've never seen kids so provoked as by this article. And so this then sent us in a whole exploration of, of, in, uh, about robotics and how robotics work, work in the world today. And um, by now, my kids are very good with use, using social media to connect. So one of my students immediately connected with the uh, author of the article to begin talking with him. I began sharing with, with Clive and with um, the author of the article. 
what was happening in my classroom. We then began to seek out people that we could talk to. So my students spoke with, had a Skype session with that, a professor of robotics at McMaster University. And we, we just, we went to the NASA site. We really began to build our understanding of, of how robotics impact the world today. And then the kids had to write opinion pieces on, on what they, sh what kind of controls they thought should be placed on robotic technology. Uh, if you want to go visit this post, what I explain here are just the flow of learning in my classroom, how fluid it is, how very much it is driven by whatever happens on one particular day that will lead us to what's going to happen the next day, and then what tools we use to enter into communication, and then how we begin to document what it is that, that we do with our learning. Um, one of the really great things about uh, having access to the Web 2.0 tools is that it really saves teacher time, teachers' time and the idea of curation. So for those of you who do not know what curation is, if you picture a museum, a curator puts together or gathers together artifacts or pictures to put it into a display. So curation, we do that in, in, uh, with Web 2.0 tool. Uh, Web 2.0 as well. There's all kinds of tools for uh, gathering resources together into one place. Um, some of the ones that are great out there are Storyfy, where you can gather current conversations. And there's just dozens of them. Paperly gathers the links that somebody might click on on Twitter. Uh, if you search for curation, all kinds of things are going to come up. So I like to use uh, use curation tools to save time for me for my planning. So um, this is a live binder, and my grade uh, seven students are beginning an exploration of the War of 1812. So rather than me beginning a Google search and trying to find out what's out there and spending hours and hours and hours gathering resources for my kids, the very first thing I do when I have a, a social studies type topic is, is do a search for live binders. And this one I did live binders, War of 1812. And this is what came up. So this has been put together by the Halton Catholic District School Board. And it's just an unbelievably rich site where all of the links you could possibly want to have are already put in one spot. And you can think of it almost like textbook production you know, done in a modern way. So rather than me having to go out and find all these separate things and run to the library, I now have a spot that I can go to and bring my kids to where they can begin developing their understanding of what the War of 1812 uh, is. There's video. There's pictures. And I'm back again. Sorry about that. Uh, so I was just talking about my job is to facilitate their learning, uh, to help them develop their questions, to maybe show some places where they haven't gone yet, to go and, and seek out more information, to facilitate the discussions that they then have about what they're learning to prompt them to ask questions about what they're, what they're learning, but all within a nice little boundary that they can't leave and then get off topic when, they're, um, when they have access to so many um, places to go to. This is a really nice way to keep kids kind of uh, closed, again, within constraints of a particular topic that we're exploring. So right now, my kids are just at the initial uh, learning stages. We haven't decided yet what we're going to do with our knowledge that we've learned. But they're busy talking, viewing, sharing uh, with each other interesting things that they find on this site. What's really nice about this, and uh, perhaps the biggest difference about this, I mean, one of the, the, the things that they'll find on this site is, is a documentary that I have shown in the past to my kids in the classroom. The difference between me putting that on in the classroom and the student finding that site on their own and choosing to view it is huge because because they're making that choice themselves to gain their knowledge in that way at that point in time, they're much more engaged with the learning and they're much more committed to watching the film carefully in order to find out what's going to happen. So there's a real shift there from a teacher telling the kids what they're going to learn to a, a student being able to choose how they're going to explore a particular topic. And it's very much, it's more relaxed, it's more fun, the kids talk about how interesting it is, and it just becomes a much richer environment in the classroom. Well, I'm almost at the end. Um, 
the area that I'm really beginning to work on for myself now is how do I assess all of this? How do I accurately assess their learning? Oh, thank you. I activate learning. I like that. <laughs> thank you, whoever said that. Um, so uh, one of the people I've come across just recently is the work of John Hattie. And I had no idea that the work that he'd done was really driving a lot of our change in education in Ontario. But what John Hattie has done is a meta-analysis, analysis of all the research in education to try and figure out what do we actually do in the classroom that works. And so what he's identified uh, as being the most useful practice that a teacher can engage in with students is, to, is the process of useful uh, feedback and teaching kids to self-assess. Uh, and that was a light bulb moment. You can actually bring a kid forward two years in their learning if you're doing formative assessment and, you know, in a really useful way and teaching the kids to self-assess. Self so that's kind of where I'm at in my own learning um, that I'm exploring in, in with Web 2.0 tools, uh, trying to figure out how to do this effectively in my classroom. And what I've just posted on my site, um, I think it's the first post that's up there today, is what I did this week in terms of teaching my kids how to think about their learning and how to accurately self-assess their work. So I'm beginning to post uh, things like that on my blog. And I think, ah, last one. Um, I, I, some people today were probably coming, hoping to see a whole list of tools that I use in my classroom. Uh, the tools that I'm looking at right now are really uh, tools for helping kids to capture their learning and then to share it because that's what we do now. We don't say you're going to all learn persuasive writing. What you do in education that's effective is you get kids to think, you work on writing, and then you get them to capture what it is that they're doing uh, in ways that are, are useful to them and then share that learning with others. So these are some great places that I've been to uh, recently to try and see apps uh, that I can download on the iPad for documenting their learning. If you really, really want to go find what can I use to meet it in the classroom, um, the site uh, Free Technology for Teachers, I think it's called. Um, let me just type that in there in the box. Uh, uh, just um, the person who runs that site is constantly finding uh, new tools that we can use in our classroom and um, sharing that on that particular site. So that's a, a site that I, I frequently go to to try and find uh, tools that I can use with my kids. And with that, I am done, Lorna. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, I copied down a few questions. Um, people are interested in about how long each of your projects um, how long you spend with your students. Uh, okay, so our school is, um, uh, we're um, a, a primary school and a middle school, and our middle school is on Rotary. So I have my students for language and social studies and technology, and the largest block of time that I will see my kids in is for a 100-minute block once a day. Um, and I might see them for another period later on in the day, so maybe maybe half the day. When I did the bigger projects like the app project and the uh, Hannah's Twitter chat and the First Nations thing, I was really lucky in that my blocks were very large uh, and I had a lot of time with my kids just that particular year. This year I have a very odd schedule and my kids have shorter time periods with me, maybe 50 minute periods and they leave and they come back. So it's <laughs> not conducive to easy flow and learning. So what I found I've had to do this year is um, do much shorter types of inquiries. The app project we started in, I believe, just at the end of May, beginning of April, and it ran right until the end of June, and actually it wasn't finished by the end of June. Uh, with the app project, the kids were so committed to it that a core group of them actually came back in September once they'd moved on to grade seven and would come into my room at, at nutrition breaks to finish up whatever needed to be done on that project. And that I never see in teaching. That's how compelling that project was. Um, other inquiries might take two weeks. It really depends on what the nature of the topic is. Of, of the topic is. But really you're kind of looking at, a, at a, 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 if you're going for full project-based learning, four to six weeks. Okay, super. And about how many projects do you do per year? Um, let's see. I probably do maybe two big ones per year. So one in the fall and then one in the springtime. And in, in between that are, are, are smaller types of learning. 
And somebody asked earlier about um, on the Twitter project, did each student have a Twitter handle or did you use a class Twitter and you posted them? How did you have that structured? Oh, okay. Um, so the whole Twitter chat is documented on my blog. I believe it's from uh, November 2011 or 10 that we did that. Um, so what we did is we created a class Twitter account. Um, I think it was at class 62 CWAC and an icon for that. And then all of the tweets that day uh, went out from us through that. So the kids were logged in on many, many, many different devices and laptops and they were in small groups, but they were all logged in with the same Twitter handle. And there were a few kids uh, who actually had their own Twitter handles, not uh, created by me, but they had created those from home and they had permission uh, to, to use those as well. Uh, what we did with the tweets, because we really wanted to make sure that we shared good information, we spent a lot of time thinking about what we actually wanted to say um, during the during the chat, and because kids can't type quickly, they're only in grade six. Uh, they worked in, in small groups to pre-create a lot of their tweets on different topics that they wanted to talk about, and we used we then would you know cut and paste and drop those in to advance the chat for the day. They were so excited when people began engaging with them and people began sharing with them. Uh, when uh, George Brady showed up on the twat on, the, on the, the, the Twitter chat, they weren't expecting that. So when he was there, that was just sent them over the top with excitement that you know the man from the story was was engaging with them. And research shows that when students have a larger audience in their classroom and their peers, they definitely increase their student achievement as well. Uh, Shambles asked, about how much time do you spend each week planning? Oh, absolutely. Planning and preparing outside of the classroom time. Okay, when I first started, <laughs> it was hundreds of hours because, um, and I, I, I really, I mean, my, my poor family that year as I was learning how to do this, it, I really had to make an incredible shift in my thinking and understanding of how learning happens. And so it was hours every evening because, I, again, I was not a, a person who used technology. My kids, you know, my, in my house used to mock me about how little I knew. Uh, so I really had to spend a lot of time just learning the logic of how, how these tools work and then uh, figuring out how to make the connections and everything was a huge growth curve. Now I don't spend as much time. I think I, you know, I would spend as much as any typical teacher would um, doing my planning for this, you know, make stay after, after school until for an hour and a half or so. I might have, a, you know, an hour in the evening where, I, where I'm doing my planning. I'll spend a bit of time on the weekends, three or four hours on the weekends. But it's, because I understand the structure now of inquiry and project-based learning, it's much easier to know what I need to do next. Great, thank you. Um, this has been a fantastic session, and I want to remind you that all of the oops, all of the links that were shared in today's session are in the live binder, and they will be posted um, on our website on our archives page, and you can find all of those links in the live binder. Again, thank you so much, Heidi, and we want to let you know that Steve Hargadon will have some interviews on. Tuesday, January 29th, he's going to be interviewing Gary Obermeyer, and on January 31st, Stephen Bezrushka, and February 5th, Carol Black, and then on February 7th, Laura Grace Weldon. So those are some great interviews that you're going to want to check out with Steve, and we want to let you know that we will not have a show next Saturday for the um, event that's going on with the DIN, as well as Educon in Philadelphia with Chad Lehman and his group. And then we'll be back on, Al on February the 2nd with Alex Dunn, again, talking about iPads as part of the Universal for Design Learning Theory, part of that toolkit. And then Matt Harding on February 9th with Kid Vlogs. And we have some other great sessions coming up, but we would always like to have your feedback and suggestions for future special guests. And the link to that form is in our live binder, and we would encourage you to nominate somebody for a featured teacher, just like Heidi was today. Anybody that works with uh, teachers or students on your campus, we'd love to hear um, have you nominate them. When you exit today, the survey link will automatically open in your browser. 
and we'd love to get your feedback on today's session as well as some future topics that you'd like to uh, hear about and explore in future sessions. In that survey, you can also request a professional development certificate for today. If you are viewing the recording or any of our recordings that are found on our archives page, you can use that survey link that's posted on the slide here and request a professional development for that um, session. Just put the title of the session as well as your name and email address and Peggy will get that out to you shortly. We want to let you know that we also have an iTunes U channel where you can subscribe and download the MP3s and MP4s of all of our set, um, sessions. And we do post those to the archives and resources page. In a blog post where you can also subscribe if you wanted to use a regular RSS feed aggregator instead of iTunes. Both options are available to you to take us with you if you happen to miss one of the live sessions. And we want to extend a very special thank you to I Heidi for presenting today and to Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of our series, as well as to Weebly for our website and each of you for providing um, a great conversation with questions and links and sharing your ideas each and every week and to Blackboard so that we can meet in this platform um, and have wonderful weekly webinars. Again, we want to remind you that uh, we won't be meeting on January 26th, so take that time to participate in Educon and the DEN event as well as um, view some of the archives. And we will see you back when we have Alex done on February 2nd. So thank you so much, Heidi, and everybody for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting You're me. You're very welcome. And thanks, everyone, for coming. We loved all the ideas that um, Heidi shared, as well as your comments. And we look forward to uh, meeting back here again at the same time on February the 2nd. Have a great weekend and a great Saturday, everybody. And see you online.